Good morning everyone, welcome back to my study. Here's a little question for you to get you thinking. We're in Isaiah 37 verses 14 to 20 this morning. I'd love you to pause and read that. And the question I've got for you is this. What is the difference between how Sennacherib sees uh, God and how Hezekiah sees God? That will get us into the passage quite nicely, I think. So hit pause and discuss and come back. Uh, in a minute. Well, remember what it was that uh, Sennacherib, or, or, or his agent, his commander, said to Hezekiah's people. Uh, the king of Assyria has gone through various lands, and uh, Assyria were a rising global superpower at this point. They've gone through various lands and wiped them out. And of course, this is a time when gods were thought to be territorial. They were thought to belong to a particular place and a particular people. And and really, any earthly battle that was happening was uh, really only an image of the heavenly battle between the gods of those various places. And so uh, the king of Assyria comes and he's he's beaten all these nations and and all these territories and and all, and his god has conquered all of the gods of these places and and so as far as he's concerned there's no difference there's no difference between all of those other gods who were the gods of their land and yahweh now what is what is it that hezekiah sees that he can't see Uh, Verse 18, it's true, Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste to all these peoples and their lands. They've thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them. Why? For they were not gods, but only wood and stone fashioned by human hands. So what is the thing that Hezekiah sees that Sennacherib doesn't? That Yahweh, the God of Israel, is not like all these other fake gods that cannot save. Now Isaiah will go on to that in 40 to 44 and give us quite a bit of attention to the ways in which Yahweh is bigger and different to these false gods but the point is at this point Hezekiah sees it he grasps it and and what are the things that he says about this god that distinguish him from other gods well he's not just a territorial god at verse 16 you made heaven and earth he's the creator he is uh, distinct from all of the other uh, false gods. And I say false gods not because there is no corresponding heavenly realm, because there is. False in the sense that they don't deserve the name God. For God with a capital G must belong to the one who made the universe, and it is the God of Israel. So what Snacker doesn't see is precisely finally what Hezekiah does see. He understands, therefore, that the God of the the universe, the God who's really there, deserves to be worshipped. He deserves to be honoured. And so, just as he did at the beginning of chapter 37, he comes before the Lord and appeals to him, uh, yes, for the rescue of his people, his land, now, Lord our God, deliver us from his hand. But he does so ultimately with the purpose of God being honoured. So that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, Lord, are the only God. God with a capital G. There is only one. And and the fact that, uh, that, that Sennacherib has gone through these lands and just wiped out the gods of these places and, and burned them in the fire really just exposes the fact that they're false, aren't they? But the God who is real is about to rise up and deliver his people in such a way that it is perfectly clear that God is really there. Now that's the that's the principle, isn't it? Now what are we to learn from this? Certainly God is really there and he is able to rise up and defend his people in a way that other gods cannot. Certainly that. But I think we should learn from the faith of Hezekiah here, shouldn't we? I wonder whether we whether our prayers, beyond the Lord's Prayer, which is clearly like this one, uh, 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 our Father in Heaven, uh, hallowed be your name, is, is precisely what Hezekiah's praying, isn't it? That all the earth may know uh, that, that the Lord is God. Uh, 
hallowed by your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. That is basically what Hezekiah is praying. And I, I wonder, therefore, whether we, beyond the Lord's Prayer, shape our prayers and shape the desires of our hearts, which, after all, prayer is an expression of, around the sort of things that we ought to be praying. Do we pray for the sort of deliverance? Uh, now, Lord God, deliver us from his hand full stop. In other words, putting us at the centre of the prayer. Uh, or do we recognise that actually God is the central actor in the story? We should pray for his honour, which we know God will always act for, and ref sort of refract our blessings through that. We know that to be God's people is to be loved by him and blessed by him and protected by him. So let's appeal to him on the, on the, on the strongest possible grounds for him to answer prayer. I wonder whether that might shape us uh, differently, put, put God more firmly in the centre of our story as our prayers more frequently represent the way that the Bible teaches us to pray. Let's pause there and let's do that, shall we? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are God. We pray that you would rise up and defend your honour in this nation where people so, uh, so often mock and scorn and deride you and your people and where your, uh, your name is defamed in ways that other gods aren't. In a pluralist society, you alone seem to be the, the, the one that, that people love to mock. Our Father, rise up and deliver uh, uh, many people from the kingdom of darkness into your wonderful light. Uh, we pray that you would bring revival, that uh, the whole world might see that you truly are the God of this land as all lands. For Jesus' sake. Amen.